the Minister of Finance have conveniently gone in for the task of the elephant. Uh, he's not coming with new innovation in order to raise additional revenue. One other way to solve the rigidities is additional revenue. One can understand that given the tax threshold of our country, it is not the way to go. Given the state of the private sector of Ghana, it is not the way to go. But for him to understand that he didn't sow the seeds, the Ghana Education Trust Fund, what is the defect of the law? Have we achieved the core object of the establishment of the Ghana Education Trust Fund? The answer is no. And therefore, when you come to cap it, as if all is well and all has been done with get fund. That is not the case. Either for free compulsory universal basic education, we have not achieved it. Access, relevant, and quality higher education, we have not achieved it. The Honorable uh, 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 Minister for Monetary Evaluation, you recall our encounter in 1997 at Akusumbo, which led to the emergence of the Ghana Education Trust Fund. It was one for which we engaged the Ghanaian public and the public alike to accept that a certain portion of revenue be dedicated, indeed, not to supplement, to supplement rather, but not to complement what was the consolidated fund to for education. So when you say defect, has get fund achieved its core objective? The answer is no. Get fund today has areas. And I'm sure many members of parliament, including communities, are yearning for additional school infrastructure. If you cannot add to it, don't cut it and don't reduce it. Mr. Speaker, that leads me to my sec the second leg of my argument, which also, and again, Mr. Speaker, may I refer to the memorandum. And Mr. Speaker, uh, the minister, in the introduction of the memorandum, and with your indulgence, I quote again, the minister says, there, I agree with him. The object of the bill is to cap earmark funds at 25% of total tax. Mr. Speaker, may I refer you now to page three where you have the minister's signature. And this is where I say that there's some sluggishness even in terms of the ownership of the words. Here he uses total tax. Now, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to page three, especially also in the memorandum line three it says earmark funds are 25 percent of tax revenue they are not the same in one breath you are talking of total revenue in another breath you are talking of tax revenue i do not know i'm referencing page three and page one if you think uh, page one uses total tax total tax revenue and then when you come to pay three, the total is lost. You have just tax revenue. But to make my point is to travel the journey again, Mr. Speaker, to Article 252 of the Constitution. We've raised it. But just for me to elucidate a new point and a suggestion. Now, 252 of the Constitution is on the District Assembly Common Fund, which says not less than 5%. But we are aware of an existing legislation which increases to 7.5%. Now, in this bill, you say wherever in any enactment there is any inconsistency, this bill must be paid. Item, three rigidity items consume about 107% of total tax revenue. These items are wages and salaries, interest and amortization, and then finally, the issue about statutory funds, or what we call the earmark funds. Now let us look at government's attempt to address each of these, and to see whether indeed this bill is just an, an attempt to run to the touch line and attach the funds that are available and move them towards a process of recentralization of funding. In the first place, wages and salaries as a major rigidity. What is the solution in our budget and what efforts is government making to address the problem of rigidities in relation to wages and salaries? In our budget, we have seen that wages and salaries as a rigidity is moving from 12 billion to 16 billion. And even before this budget has been passed, 
the appointment and nomination of ministers has become a mass recruitment of ministers. An issue that is going to jeopardize the rigidity of wages and salaries even before the budget is passed. And so there is no boldness in tackling the issue of rigidities. Otherwise, we should be seeing a leaner and efficient government and not a very large government that will impact on wages and salaries and strengthen the rigidities. And so rigidities in relation to wages and salaries, as far as government is concerned, is not a rigidity. It doesn't require any effort to address it. Rather, it requires an effort to escalate it. That cannot be a fair treatment of rigidities. The other challenge with wages and salaries is that Whereas we have state institutions that are mandated to deliver development at the grassroots, this budget is seeking to create further bureaucracies. We want to introduce Northern Development Authority. We want to introduce Central Development Authority. We want to introduce Coastal Development Authority. These are further, further bureaucracies that are going to further, that are going to further compound wages and salaries as a rigidity. And therefore, it is quite clear that the focus on addressing rigidities is skewed in favor of where there is money. Let's go for the money and leave the rest. The, memo, the memorandum that is following the bill is giving rationale and indicating rigidities as a major reason for which we must pass this bill. And so we must be addressing the issue of rigidities and not just the earmarking of funds, because it is only one of three rigidities identified in the memorandum that is presented before us. Lot of money from Get Fund has taken away a lot of money from uh, the universities, has taken a lot of money from the Ghana Airport Company. You see, these institutions have retained their IGM and they have already awarded contracts which are under construction. For instance, the whole Airport is under construction and is being funded by the Ghana Airport Company. Now, if you cap, yeah, if you take the APSC from the Ghana Airport Company, how is it going to complete the project? How is it going to complete the project in one, which are being funded by the, uh, the Ghana Airport Company Limited? Mr. Speaker, the, there is. Mr. Speaker, the. One of the reasons given by the minister is that there have been previous, there, there have been previous sources of uh, funding from loans. The loans are too many. That's their claim. But this capping does not preclude the finance minister from borrowing. Because if you take, if you take the budget, if you take the budget, page 165, there is domestic net borrowing of over 12 billion. It is there. So the government does not preclude the government from borrowing. I think it is unfair on the part of the minister to suggest that these institutions are mismanaging and misusing funds that are located to them. And I think he should apologize to the hard-working managers of our state institutions.